Um, okay, so we're going to start the uh, the last lecture of the day. Um, this is probably the the last time you have to hear me, so it's good for me. <laughs> um, so this this is actually I would say the most fun lecture that I that of the day for me. Uh, this is stuff that I've been working on for years and years, and um, it was actually um, the apps you're about to use are some of the ones that I originally developed. Uh, uh, I don't know, like ten years ago. Um, so. Um, I know this part really well, so if you you can, you can try and stump me if you want. Um, this is um, uh, just like the previous lectures; is all available under the Creative Commons license. You're free to use it um, as you see fit. Um, the next hour and a half, I guess, we're going to be looking at a whole bunch of Cytoscape apps. Uh, primarily, we are going to be focused on using the enrichment map. Um, and it used to be that I would do part of the the lecture on two other apps that we also use in our in our enrichment map pipeline called auto annotate and word cloud but in the last year we've actually um kind of i, I would say moved them to the background but you no longer need to really know about them because we tr we try and do it all automatically but i'll still mention them so you can understand how you can play around with them and make your enrichment maps even better so i hope that at the end of this lecture you guys will understand um how to create um, um, how to take your enrichment maps and sorry, how to create, how to take your enrichment results from G Profiler, GSCA, or one of many other enrichment tools. Although we only go over GSCA and G Profiler, um, enrichment map is actually compatible with any generic enrichment map format. So if you're using a specialized tool, as long as you can get your results into a very, very generic format, um, you can actually use enrichment map. Um, there are also other tools that we use specifically, like Great or David. There's a whole bunch of other tools that we also support, even though we don't go over them in the course. Um, and I hope that you will understand the difference between a network and an enrichment map. An enrichment map is a specialized network that we're going to create. So I mentioned in the previous lecture how it's important how you define your nodes and how you define your edges. And so we are going to define our nodes and our edges of an enrichment map different to what you just did in the previous lab. Um, and hopefully, I, will, I, I hope that you will be able to summarize your network, um, not necessarily using the auto annotate app, but understanding how the auto annotate app um, helps to summarize your network. So um, from lab number from lab number two, we use GProfiler and GSEA, and we um, generated enrichment results. And these enrichment results were simply, I don't know if anybody opened them, right? We all downloaded them in the apps and we all created these folders with lots of files, but generally it consists of a table and that table consists of lists of pathways and associated statistics. So we went from a list of genes to a table of pathways. And again, it's not, it's not something that is um, interpretable necessarily. You can take that list and you can skim through it and you can try and find what looks interesting, but ultimately it's one long list to another long list. And ideally we wanna be able to summarize that information in, in a better format. And this is kind of like a general um, format of what we did. We took our list or our experimental data. Um, we used a enrichment test and that enrichment test took um, lots of different databases um, from pathway sources. Um, and uh, ultimately we ended up with an enrichment table. So we go from one table to another table, but we are incorporating additional information um, along the way. But we did two different methods of this, right? We took our ranked list or our thresholded list. So for our ranked list, we used GSEA and we used our pathways and we um, outputted a set of upregulated pathways and downregulated pathways. And for our thresholded list, we used G profiler, we used the subset of our list. Now it's important to note, we didn't do this in lab two, but if you have run an experiment and you have upregulated and downregulated genes, you can actually run G profiler twice with two different sets of genes and generate two sets of G profiler results and then visualize them together, right? So you don't only have to use G profiler with one subset of your genes. I did not do that. <laughs> um, you can actually run it multiple times. The same, same applies also to, um, um, I believe it was one of the networks that um, 
uh, Gary showed this morning, he showed an, a, 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 pen, a pendomoma network with multiple types, I think were nine types of ependomomas. Um, and it was actually a large network with lots of different colors. And what's interesting was that each one of those was actually done using G-Profiler. It wasn't a GSCA analysis. It was, you can actually do multiple thresholded lists with G-Profiler and generate multiple sets of results and visualize them together. So G-Profiler is not limited to just one list. You can actually run it with many things. So as we discuss um, network basics, right, right, we, just went through a lab where we played a lot with uh, biological networks where the, where the node was a gene and the edge that connected two genes was some sort of um, interaction between those two genes. And that's what the traditional network that people kind of, um, when they think of uh, networks in biology, those are the types of networks that people think of. Um, in this case though, we're gonna like create a new type of network. And this new type of network is going to be an enrichment map. Now, in the enrichment map, our node is no longer a gene, our node is a pathway. So one of our enrichment results and uh, the connections between our pathways are the genes that they have in common. So one thing that I didn't mention with these pathway databases, and um, there are a lot of different pathway databases, they come from many, many different sources and there's a huge amount of redundancy between these sources, right? So what reactome defines cell cycle and wiki pathway defines cell cycle and go defines cell cycle they're basically all the same pathway they're probably not identical right because they ultimately come from different sources and different curators or whatever but they're very very similar you don't necessarily care that there's seven different cell cycles in your results all you care about is that they're cell cycle so what this enrichment map does not only does it visualize your path your pathways as a network it also clusters pathways that are very, very similar together. So each node in our network is a um, pathway. And then each edge that connects those pathways are actually the genes that they have in common. So we actually use, um, there's a few different statistics that are available in the enrichment map. Um, there's the jacquard, there's the overlap, and there's the combined. But the, the basic is, it's the basic, the, the same concept. We basically count the number of genes that they have in common, and we're using the um, we're using the overlap statistic, which is basically just the union of your two sets divided by the minimum of your set A or B. And what what you're doing is you're calculating the similarity between your two gene sets. And when we create that network, if your two gene sets have enough in common, there'll be an edge between them. You set when you create your network, you set that threshold such that it creates, um, it pulls together gene sets or pathways that are highly similar. So basically what we've done is we've taken this tabular format where we have each pathway and its associated p-value, and now we've translated it into a network. And all of a sudden, some of the um, redundancy in that table has been decreased, right? Um, but we're also able to um, we're also able to visualize more than just the connection between these two pathways, right? Because the size of the node is actually related to the number of genes in a given gene set. So the larger the gene set, um, the more genes there are in that gene set. You don't you're not limited to that because there are other features that you can associate with your network as you see fit. Um, one that people like to use a lot of is instead of doing the size of the gene set. You can actually do the um, normalized enrichment score. So you can make the nodes um, larger if they are more significant in your data set. So then you'll have like you'll they'll pop out the, the gene sets that are most significant in your in your data set. Uh, but by default, I think it's the size of um, the number of genes in your gene set. Um, then also you can the edges are also correlated with the uh, value of your overlap statistics. So the larger the edge, the more overlap there is. Uh, one of the features inside Escape is you, you can actually play around with that feature. So you can actually reduce your overlap so that you can um, bring things together and uh, separate things by getting rid of edges. There are different use cases that you can use for enrichment maps. The first most simple one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. When you said like the size of the edge, is that like the Yes. I think okay. yes. Is there any correlation or anything with the distance between two, or those are just magically? Okay, so we okay. The enrichment map does not use distance at all. Okay. 
Um, I do believe that there are some layouts that can use distance. Like you have to associate it with a parameter in the yeah. network, but you can use distance for some things, but it's only for the layout. Yeah. yeah. Not with like the visual style. Okay, there are multiple use cases that I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over just briefly, just some of the use cases uh, that we can use in Richer Map 4. The most standard one is a um, two, uh, two class design, whether it's disease versus control or whether it's um, subtype A versus subtype B, bless you. But you're basically you run a regular enrichment analysis and you either have G profiler results or you have GSEA results and you create a simple um, network. Now this is a this is a very clean, this is not what the network's gonna look like when you initially create your enrichment map. Um, this was um, this was actually all done manually. This is one of the original uh, prototypes of the enrichment map. And when we first created the enrichment map, this concept of these circles around it didn't exist automatically, but it does now. Um, but basically, each one of these nodes is a pathway, and a connection are um, the, uh, the similarities between those pathways. And what the person who created this network did was they took areas of the, of the network and basically summarized them further and added annotations associated with each one of those bubbles, meaning that most of those pathways in a given cluster are, for example, associated with DNA metabolism. And they looked at all of the different pathways in there in order to define that, um, define that label. Uh, but it's basically a summary of your entire enrichment results. And what, what's happened here, we've gone from a table that potentially has hundreds of records or some hundreds of lines now to a network that contains, I'm not gonna say a handful, but let's say like 20 different clusters. And it's a lot easier to um, deduce what's happening in this given comparison. This was using estrogen time points, yes? Thanks, um, here the edges, they are based on the genes that are exposed upregulated and shared between two nodes, right? Yeah, only shared. Only it, do, it doesn't matter up, up regulation or down regulation. It's just the nodes that they, sorry, the genes that they have in common. So like I find two pathways in the atom and I do it without any expression modules. Just ask these genes are shared. Yeah, yeah, you can, 100%. Um, you'll get a different picture if you could, generally when you run GSEA, it filters your pathways based on your expression set. So if, if a given pathway has uh, 20 genes in general, and then only 10 of those genes are in your expression set, then you will create the, the network with all those 10 genes. If you take out the expression set, you'll, you'll calculate different um, overlaps. So, so I, I wonder why is it helpful to have the clean lines not on the expression set? Okay, well, so sometimes you don't have an expression set. Um, if you want to compare two different data sets, or that there is actually an option in this for that, where it says like filter by expression, but you can turn that off when you filter not. If you're doing two different experiments and there's different sets of genes that are expressed in each one, and you want to compare those networks like apples to apples, then you have to make sure that the edges are the same between them. If you're using the same GMP file, take out the expression file, it's going to create the same uh, image map every time. If you have the expression, it will, what will happen if you run GS, sorry, if you run Richard map, you'll actually have two different colored edges if you filter by expression, because the statistics are the same. Uh, sorry, the statistics are different based on your expression sets. Yeah. So in G Profiler, when I click my map the buttons, there's the option to have my gene table, like my pathway table, um, be smaller. Like to, it summarizes them. I don't want that. If I'm doing yes, that. exactly. Are you are you seeing that first screen that comes up in G Profiler? That that is a relatively new feature okay. of G Profiler, where like when you you load it initially at the bottom. I like driver. Friendly. Yeah, yeah. So that it has like this new. They're tr truthfully, I don't know how they. I, I I went over this last year. Um, Vernie, do you know exactly how they're summarizing them? I don't remember right now. Same we checked last year. Yeah, we checked last year. Yeah. So they're calculating clusters, okay. and then they, they are choosing one that they think is the best from that cluster, and that's what they're showing you. Okay. But yeah, you don't want to filter by those at this point. Got it. Okay. They're trying to do what they're trying to do what we do with enrichment, kind of like the same thing, but without having to make a network. What would be the point of that? Like for a 
figure in the paper. It's, it's also just good if somebody's running G Profiler and they're just looking to like get a brief summary, it's just a lot easier to just have that pop out. A lot of this is like G Profiler might not be part of the pipeline. It's just like a, a low hanging fruit. Let's see what this data looks like. And like it's very easy to do it that way. Okay. I don't yeah. Closer than Sorry. I can tell the difference too. I just don't like to hear myself in my stereo. So I keep on moving away. So um, if we want to just, um, you can actually zoom in on an individual cluster if you want to get any more information. So this is just a highlight an individual cluster from the, um, uh, the network I just previously showed you. So another uh, cool feature, I guess, of Enrich from App is that it's not limited to just one data set. You can actually use multiple data sets. Um, so the, the basic use use case, I guess, is you wanted to use, this was, this was a initially, and I think more and more people create data sets with loads of uh, data sets. So it's actually not even relevant anymore, the idea of just having two data sets. But uh, when Enrichment Map was initially created, it was one data set or two data sets, and that was cool. Uh, but now it's more like one data set or 100 data sets. Um, so it's a little bit different. But initially, the way the way it was structured was you could actually run Enrichment Map with two different data sets. So here's an example with an estrogen time point series where we had 12 hour uh, treated cells at 12 hours and treated cells at 24 hours. And the addition in this network is that the inside of the node is the 12 data set and the outside of the node is 24. Yeah. Like I have methylation and I have extraction data, if I just have my two lists, would that work or it needs to be like? No, it, it would work. Methylation, okay. The thing is, is it depends on what you're trying to show, yeah. right? Because methylation is, you can also, there's other ways you can add that methylation data in that's not necessarily an enrichment map. Uh, but yeah, you can use different data sets. You'll have different edges because the, the universe is different. Um, another cool feature, I guess, of the enrichment map is you can click on an individual node and you can see the expression of the genes um, for that individual node. And over here, I'm just highlighting two different um, nodes within this network, one in which it's, it's upregulated at 12 hours and one that's upgraded at 24. And you can see there's a clear difference in the expression between the 12 hours and the 24. Um, Another use case, this is kind of uh, more to what we are mentioning a second ago, is um, you can also take your enrichment map and do something that's called a post-analysis. So you have a set of pathways that are differentially regulated in your data set, and now you want to ask the question of like, okay, um, I'm interested in this drug. Does this drug... Um, does this drug have any targets in any of the pathways that are upregulated or downregulated? And so you can do a post analysis where you take the list, this drug and its associated targets, and you annotate it on top of the network. And um, it's not just limited to um, drugs or drug targets. You can also use microRNA. So you you have a microRNA, a specific microRNA that's uh, misregulated in your data set. You can grab its targets and then add it as a post analysis on your network. And um, another thing, final use case, I guess, is this is the ependymoma um, data set that Gary mentioned earlier this morning. Um, you can actually run enrichment map with multiple data sets. There is a limit to the amount of information um, that we can physically see. Meaning, so the way enrichment map works is here, this is a very pretty example where you have basically pathways that are found in one subtype versus not found in, found in only one subtype as opposed to being found in two or three or four. Um, so it makes a very pretty picture. But in, in reality, uh, when you have multi data sets, you're cutting the node into like into pies and there's there's probably a limit to the amount of information that you can physically see, right? So you can, you can, you can actually annotate it, let's say the 10 data sets, but you won't, Unless it comes out as perfectly clean as this, you won't necessarily be able to see um, each individual data set in that pie. Uh, but it still it it still has many many usages to be able to see lots of different data sets. Um, I have done this with up to four hundred, but I'm not visualizing something like this um, because I'm more interested in general themes across all four hundred patients, for instance. Um, so um, image map is designed to work um, 
Um, uh, image map is designed to work for G profiler data, GSEA data. There are specific features though that are optimized for GSEA. So there's uh, GSEA, when you run GSEA, it creates a whole folder of information and there's a lot of data that we actually pull out of GSEA. Um, some of the cool features that I guess you can have with your Cytoscape network is um, we have slider bars on, so when you initially create your network, um, if you want to kind of try and figure out um, what an optimal p-value threshold would, would be, you can actually play around with the slider bars and you can add or remove nodes based on their p-value or their FDR threshold, ideally their FDR threshold. Um, and then you can also add, and sorry, you can also get rid of edges based on their overlap coefficient. So if you have like, a big massive hairball and everything's all interconnected, you can actually play around with that um, that slider bar in order to um, fine tune your parameters. Um, within the, within the, uh, the Cytoscape framework, uh, we also have um, a list of all of the, um, we also have a, a, sorry, a tab called the heat map, right? So I mentioned this before, right? So if you click on an individual node or a cluster of nodes, you can see the expression of the genes in that cluster or in that node. Um, an important, interesting feature, I guess. Okay, so sorry, one other thing is the, the top, you probably did this in the Cytoscape lab as well. You can search for individual genes. You can search for individual gene sets to kind of try and find, like if you have a specific gene of interest, for example, you can say, okay, show me all of the pathways that this gene is found in. And so this is just a just an example of searching for individual gene and then it's highlighted all of the gene sets associated with it. This is a feature that is specifically um, associated with this is a, a feature that's specifically associated with the enrichment map. Veronique mentioned it when she was talking about um, GSCA. I don't think I mentioned it, but um, there's the concept of the leading edge, right? So when we looked at those GSCA plots, at the point at which the ES score is its max, any gene that is found before that ES score, the enrichment score reaches its max, it's called um, the leading edge. And if you click on an individual node inside the scape, sorry, in the enrichment map that has been run with GSCA, this only works for GSCA, um, it will highlight the genes that are part of this leading edge. So these are the genes that have driven the enrichment of this gene set. So this is kind of useful when you're drilling down into the details, like you found a pathway that is interesting and you wanna find out more about um, the genes that are causing the enrichment of this pathway. And they're just highlighted in the, um, Sorry, they're just highlighted in the heat map panel at the bottom. Okay, so, oh, sorry. Okay, I'm going to go over this briefly, but just know that a lot of this stuff happens automatically. Um, there are three other apps that um, are very useful when you're using the enrichment map, and they are Auto Annotate, Cluster Maker, and Word Cloud. And Cluster Maker, is the first one that's run. And basically it takes your enrichment map and it calculates all the clusters of nodes. And it uses by default, a specific clustering algorithm called MCL, um, creates those clusters. And the, for each one of those clusters, it grabs the, um, the names of the pathways and it tries to quickly calculate what words would best describe that cluster. Um, so ideally you have a cluster of cell cycle type um, pathways and it will pull cell cycle out and that's, that will be the most prominent words in that cluster. Auto annotate then used to draw a circle around it, right? Cell cycle above it. So basically try to summarize it for you. Okay. So truthfully, we've changed the enrichment map such that that happens automatically. When you create your enrichment map this time, um, you'll see, you won't see circles, but you'll see in a given cluster, you'll see one node with a larger name. So we're trying to make those pop out, right? So basically we're trying to make it even easier. You don't even have to run the auto annotate app, but I want, to, I want you to know that it exists because what happens is if you want to create, if you want to modify your network, if you want to change those labels, it's all something that you can do. It's these, this is an additional, pressing the wrong button. Uh, this is a, an additional app within Cytoscape that you can use, right? So it clusters the network for each cluster. It, calculates the, the most frequent words in them. It selects the top three words um, and it puts those three words above a circled cluster. 
and the auto, oh, sorry, I keep on doing the wrong thing. Okay, so um, the auto annotate, you can see there's actually a lot of, um, there's a lot of granularity in this app. You can do a lot. A list on the left-hand side are all the different clusters. You can click on an individual cluster and then highlight it and go to it. So if there's a specific function that you like, you can actually click on it and then uh, go directly to that cluster. You can control the type of annotation there are, a circle or a square and the colors associated with it, um, how much padding there is, and you can also control the labels. But truthfully, you don't have to do any of that if you like the way your network looks. Yes. It sounds like here we are creating hierarchy of different pathways, like we may be parent pathway. So right? it's, we call them themes, not a parent pathway. So Reacto is actually built on a hierarchy, yes. right? So the sub pathways that are yep. here, these are from all different sources and we don't have the hierarchy, but we call them, like we call it the pathway theme, right? They're, 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 not, they're not necessarily all with the same hierarchy, but they're related, right? And you can actually, like, if you actually drill down into some of these, some of the pathways don't seem right, right? They don't seem to have the right name for what the theme is, but often it's because um, a sub part of that pathway is actually part of the theme, right? Based on the filtering of your expression data, even though the name says something else, it's actually the genes that are important in that pathway. But here these themes are created by, killed by association. Yes, right? yes. So um, you can bring together very distant pathways without the functional, non-functional connection. Yes, potentially. Yes, but I mean, they generally are very like they're generally like the same pathway from different sources, or part of um, a tree, like a, a branch in the Go, or a part of a branch in Reactome. Right? They're like a lot of the connectivity I find comes from the hierarchical nature of Go and Reactome. So my question is then, would it be a good alternative to just look for the highest level pathway from those chains? We have we have experimented with stuff like that. Um, you could to simplify. We the problem is you you do lose some detail, right? Because some of those specialized pathways, like there are instances where you're only going to get lower down the branch, right? You only see part of it. So if you then like, because one of the things that Go did initially was like go, go slims, right? So they just tried to like collapse those 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 mm -hmm. those chains, right? And didn't get the same power uh, when you you kind of lose some of that granularity. So it, it is something you can try a hundred percent. You can also choose to just take out Go or Reactome and run with databases that are not as redundant. But then you're not going to get the same like. You might get like three nodes kind of thing. It's not the same picture that you're going to get, right? Um, yeah. So another another nice thing, which is not which is part of the auto annotate app, um, and not something that's done automatically, is you can actually take your large network. So you can't really see it so much here, but this is the 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 large network in the background. Um, you can actually then collapse to the themes. Right, because it's not necessarily important every single node that you have in your network. Um, you're actually more often more interested in the general themes. So you can take those clusters of nodes which represent highly redundant pathways and collapse them to an individual node which represents the theme of that section, and then you might get a much um, smaller network.